We'd held suspicions about organised dog fighting in Adelaide suburbs for months. But it was a tip-off to our cruelty hotline that led our inspectors to a Hillcrest property in August 2016. In the backyard, they found six aggressive dogs, many bearing scars from vicious fights. Inside the house, blatant evidence of a systematic effort to train deadly aggression into each dog. <coughs> The man behind all this was 39-year-old Ben Hamilton, and the case against him this year became South Australia's first successful organised dog fighting prosecution. It's the first time that RSPCA busted into the secretive and highly organised world of dog fighting. So tonight we're going to take a closer look at just how that landmark Hamilton case was built and won. So Christy, that first call to our cruelty report hotline came through to you. What first alerted you to the fact that this could be a dog fighting case and what were the first steps that you took? Yeah, so the, the report did come through to me um, and I immediately recognised the address as a property that I had attended uh, in the past um, and at that time I had been quite suspicious of the property um, but unfortunately we didn't have enough evidence then to be able to secure a warrant. Um, so I really wanted to make sure this time that we got as much information as we could uh, so that we would be successful in gaining a warrant um, to enter the property. So I made a phone call to the reporter who was also quite um, suspicious themselves, but we did gain a lot more information uh, and I applied for a warrant with the Adelaide Magistrates Court and we were successful in, in getting a, a warrant. So, um, yeah, we were able to attend the property. Mm, and it was that warrant that allowed you and a team of inspectors to essentially raid the Hillcrest property. What, um, how many dogs did you find there and what kind of condition were they in? Yeah, so we, we did attend the property and uh, we located six dogs in the backyard of that property. Um, there were staffy type dogs. There was three males and three females. Um, they were all uh, uh, wearing thick, heavy collars um, and on heavy chains in separate areas of the backyard. Um, they were actually in really, really good physical condition. Um, they were actually extremely muscular looking dogs, more so than any other dog I've seen before. Um, so that was a pretty clear indication that they had been through some pretty, pretty rigorous uh, training regimes to sort of bulk up. Um, they were quite reactive to us, barking and lunging um, at us and also rea very reactive to one another in the yard. Mm, and one chewed through one of our crates? Yeah, we, when we needed to transport the dogs um, after seizure, um, one of the dogs was put into a plastic ANSET crate for travel and um, she actually did chew through the plastic to it to get out of that cage and so we were really worried about transporting them in our vehicles um, together because they just really, um, really disliked each other. Mm. And so it was immediately obvious to you that you were dealing with dog fighting here? Yeah, I had done a bit of research before attending the property. So um, to me, it was very obvious immediately um, that the dogs, um, you know, were involved in some capacity in, in fighting. Um, but once we entered inside the actual property, um, it, it became blatantly obvious there was just so much evidence laying around inside the property. Mm. So obviously a lot of investigation followed on from that, um, but meanwhile those dogs did have to be cared for as well. Kim, you worked on the team at our Lonsdale shelter that looked after these dogs. What did you first notice about them when they came into the Lonsdale shelter? Yeah, so initially we noticed that the dogs were actually fairly reserved, which makes sense after such a, a big transition going from such an unusual environment into a shelter environment. So they were actually quite nervous at the start, but their behaviour was very quick to change and they did escalate quite quickly. So we straight away saw a lot of reactivity towards staff, even going past the kennels, so barking, lunging, growling, um, tense body language, a lot of kennel guarding behaviour. Um, and they were also highly reactive to other dogs. So it was very clear from early on that we would have to proceed with extreme caution just to keep our staff safe. Mm. Hamilton's lawyer later on argued in court that the dogs were loved families pets that he used for hunting on occasion. Um, what would you say about that? Interesting. Um, <laughs> look, I would say that if he was to argue, say, he used the dogs for pig hunting, um, those sort of injuries, it's a very different type of injury. So with dog fighting, scars are typically to the face, the neck, the front legs, um, the chest. With 
pig hunting, pigs will attack with the tusks. So it's more like an injury on the side and the scarring is very different. Dog fighting dogs will often have scars and wounds in various stages of healing as well. And the other thing is that dogs that are used for pig hunting are generally very dog social because they have to work together in a cohesive unit, whereas dogs that are used for dog fighting are not dog social for obvious reasons. So these dogs were highly reactive to other dogs, but also to each other. So there's just no way they could have worked as a cooperative unit in that way. Mm. What was it like to manage such aggressive dogs in a shelter environment? It was very challenging, um, very emotionally draining, um, hard on our staff because we invested a lot in these dogs and we really loved and cared for them even though they weren't behaviourally normal dogs. It was almost like we always had to be two steps ahead because managing them wasn't like managing a normal dog. They were so easily overly stimulated. Um, they were so reactive to other dogs, highly aggressive. Um, things like we try and do enrichment for them to maintain their mental welfare and we'd hang up enrichment toys in their kennels and they would jump and hold on to these toys. And because of their previous training to clamp and hold on to things and not let go, they would hold on to these toys until their gums bled suspended up in their kennels and they just wouldn't unlock their jaws. So we had to remove these toys. So we just had to think of different things outside the square to try and maintain them. Uh, we also had staff grabbed and clothing ripped because they just wouldn't let go once they had a hold of something. So mm -hmm. some of them required two staff at all times just for our safety and just to keep them safe and other people and dogs in the shelter as well. Mm. So Damon, when inspectors and legal counsel start building a major case like this, what kind of evidence are you looking for? Uh, evidence primarily uh, comes from the written statements of inspectors. Uh, then it's backed up by vet statements and behavioralist statements. The inspectors also uh, take photos. Um, uh, more recently, uh, we've been using body-worn camera footage. Um, and that uh, body-worn camera footage is... Um, uh, probably the best evidence that we can use because it provides real-time um, snapshot of exactly what the inspectors see. Mm. Um, uh, they do say that a, a picture is worth a, a thousand words and that is absolutely true uh, when talking about evidence uh, that's been gathered. And ultimately it boils down to evidence because uh, that evidence is going to be used to prove beyond reasonable doubt the charges that we're bringing to court. Mm. So Christy, let's talk a little bit uh, more about a bit of that evidence. A lot of drugs were found at Hamilton's Hillcrest property. What exactly were they and what would he have been using them for? Yeah, so we did find a huge uh, amount of drugs at the property, um, in the kitchen, in, in the fridge and in the laundry. Um, there was a, a range of drugs, so there was prescription drugs, um, there was non-prescription drugs or um, there was um, Schedule 8 drugs, which are drugs which are only supposed to be used in by a vet in a veterinary clinic um, and kept under lock and key, um, so they shouldn't be out in the community. Um, there was uh, other types of drugs like anabolic steroids, which would have been used in the same way um, as they would with a human to bulk up and, and build muscle. Um, we also found a really large amount of medical supplies, so um, things like syringes and needles, um, giving sets and IV fluid bags, uh, staple guns, um, suture kits for stitching up dogs after they'd... Um, after, the, after fights and stitching up their injuries. Um, yeah, so just a, hu a huge amount of drugs um, were, were located at the property. And, and you found evidence that Hamilton had been enrolled in a vet course? Yeah, later on when we were uh, investigating further, we found some information on a laptop which was seized, which, um, which indicated that he was enrolled in a, in a veterinary nursing course, which was really concerning um, the lengths that he was willing to go to to be able to access the drug, drugs and also um, gain some knowledge on how he could treat his own dogs after they'd been injured in fights. Mm. So you've actually brought in some of the evidence that you found and uh, there is a table full of evidence over there which I'd encourage you all to have a look at. It's, um, it's pretty amazing stuff. But we've got a couple here for you to go through. What, what yes. have we got here? So I um, just have got here, there's a couple of um, these wooden sticks um, which are called break sticks or bite sticks. Um, you can see this one's been used quite significantly but basically it's a, 
a short wooden stick with a round handle and um, sort of a flat end. Um, and what it's used for is when a dog has hold of another dog, um, you stick the flat end into the dog's mouth and then twist it to prise the jaw open, basically unlock the jaw so that you can release, um, release the dog that it's got a hold of. Um, so you can, yeah, you can see they've been used quite significantly. And uh, I've also got down here um, this contraption here, which is called a spring pole. So Kimberly talked about um, some of the issues they had at the shelter with uh, some of the enrichment toys, which uh, I do hang um, f uh, some of the dogs um, that they had some issues with at the shelter because each dog at the property um, in the area that they were living in had one of these hanging from a tree or a beam. Um, it's basically a really heavy duty spring at the top, um, thick chains, rope, and then at the bottom there is a piece of cow hide. So the idea of it is that it's hanging up from the tree, um, the dog uh, jumps up and latches onto the cow hide and then basically lifts its whole body weight off the ground and hangs from that piece of cow hide um, and it's a, a jaw strengthening exercise basically. So it creates um, strength in the jaw, which obviously um, in turn is gonna do a lot more damage in a fight, um, have a much stronger bite. Was it surprising that you found so much evidence on that property so easily? Yeah, it was really surprising when we, when we first went into the house, we were very surprised at just how much evidence there was and how out in the open it was. It was just everywhere throughout the house, just, you know, in plain sight. It was very surprising. Mm. He didn't expect to be caught? No, uh, he, he, he didn't expect to be caught. No, not at all. Mm. So, Damon, a forensic investigator worked with RSPCA to break into Hamilton's laptop and two mobile phones that were seized as part of that initial raid. What was found on them and how useful was that to you in court? The, uh, the forensic uh, investigation side is uh, equally as important as the gathering of physical evidence on the day of seizure. Um, the uh, forensic uh, discovery um, complements, if you like, the, uh, the, the physical uh, evidence that's seized. And it, uh, it, it's um, like a, a missing piece of a jigsaw puzzle. It just uh, it adds uh, to the weight of the evidence that we, we seized on the day. Um, uh, Inspector Christie had the uh, unenviable task of wading through uh, this material and uh, she uh, had to uh, look at um, uh, pornography, um, uh, other unsavoury material, uh, but at the end of it, it was all there. Um, uh, Christie uh, unveiled photographs of injured dogs, photographs of dead dogs. Um, uh, uh, website articles of uh, dog fighting, uh, instructions of how to train, and uh, uh, also uh, quite uh, compelling was uh, a photo of Hamilton himself uh, uh, without a shirt on uh, with a tattoo across his stomach, ironically showing uh, dog fighting. So, Kim, Hamilton's six dogs, they spent six, several months at our Lonsdale shelter and they went, underwent a lot of specialist behavioural assessments in that time. What were the findings of those assessments? So, initially the dogs were assessed by our behaviour team at the shelter. Um, pretty quickly we recommended that five out of the six would need behavioural medication just to help them cope and help their brains function more normally um, in the shelter environment. Um, but unfortunately, it became apparent very quickly that the six dog also required medication as he very quickly changed with his behaviour. Um, we also fitted all of the dogs with Adaptil collars. So Adaptil is a synthesised version of the pheromone that a lactating mum dog will excrete for her puppies. So the idea is that it has a calming effect, but for these dogs, it didn't really touch the sides. So unfortunately, we did have to go more down the um, behavioural medication path and multiple medications as well. So... The assessments we did showed that these dogs were incredibly hypervigilant at all times, very easily stressed, um, highly dog reactive and aggressive, um, and they showed a lot of fear aggression towards unfamiliar people as well. Um, the ones who could build a relationship with staff could be managed by those staff um, relatively uneventfully. Others remained wary at all times, so we did have to be very cautious. 
The dogs were also later behaviourally assessed by an outside expert, so Dr Eleanor Parker, who is a veterinary behaviour consultant here in South Australia, and her findings were extensive, so the report was just massive, and she provided multiple medical and psychiatric diagnoses, so things including severe generalised anxiety disorder, um, suspected post-traumatic stress disorder, issues with impulse control, um, severe hyperarousal disorder, um, dog and people aggression, fear-related aggression towards people. Um, yeah, it was just, it was really horrifying to know what these dogs were suffering with mentally. Um, and her recommendations from her assessments were firstly that the dogs never be returned to their previous owner for fear that they would be subject to further abuse, neglect and suffering. Um, secondly, that they never be rehomed into the community because of the risk that that would pose. And thirdly, that they be humanely put to sleep as soon as possible. Um, she determined that the reason they were the way they were was due to genetics and also due to their learning experience, so what they had been through. And once the court had legally placed those dogs into RSPCA care, the decision was made almost immediately to euthanise them all. Why was that? Would those animals, animals that have been conditioned to such extreme levels of aggression ever have been safe to rehome? Yeah, look, it's a really sad story, but unfortunately, no, they never would have been safe to rehome. Um, the staff all really loved and cared for these dogs. And, you know, if they could have been rehomed, that would have been amazing. But with what they'd been through, they just weren't like behaviourally normal dogs. So they didn't respond to dog behavioural cues like a more behaviourally normal dog would. So things like a dog that has been bred and trained for fighting, if another dog is showing appeasement signs, they won't back down. So they will keep fighting to the point of exhaustion or death. Um, yeah, and they were suffering as well. So all of the mental illnesses they had, it would have been inhumane towards their welfare for us to rehome them. And it also would have essentially been placing a ticking time bomb out in the community. Mm. They were all Staffy dogs and many people do believe that Staffies are a dangerous breed. What would you say to that? I would say that's absolutely not true. So this is definitely not a reflection on the Staffy breed. We know that on the whole, Staffies are some of the most lovely dogs out. They make wonderful family companions. They can be social with other dogs. Um, some of the nicest dogs I've ever met are Staffy type dogs. This is not a reflection on the breed. This is a reflection on this one individual and what he chose to subject these animals to. So Damon, our inspectors and legal counsel, you, <laughs> used all of this evidence to prepare a hugely in-depth case. Um, we thought there would be a really long trial, this being the first time in South Australia that a dog fighting case had ever been prosecuted. What happened on the morning of the trial um, in April this year to change all of that? Uh, we were geared up for a fight. Uh, we had briefed Murray Shaw QC um, uh, and she had agreed to act pro bono. Uh, as she uh, always does for us. Uh, on the morning of trial, Hamilton, uh, in consultation with his lawyer, uh, decided that uh, he would plead guilty. Um, uh, my view is that primarily the evidence against him was overwhelming. Um, he pleaded guilty uh, to uh, avoid putting RSPCA at the cost and expense of running a trial. Uh, and for that, uh, he obtained a, a discount on penalty. Uh, had he have run the trial and lost, which, again, we thought the evidence was capable of uh, proving the charges, um, he would have received uh, arguably a higher penalty. Mm. So what penalty did he receive for his actions? Uh, he got seven months uh, imprisonment, um, which, again, uh, weighed against the maximum of four years is uh, not even close. Um, but uh, in saying that, it's still the highest penalty that we've achieved in any prosecution uh, that we've ever run. Um, uh, that being said, a, a little bit of the gloss uh, was lost from that uh, seven-month penalty because he was already serving uh, a term of imprisonment for other matters. Um, it's, it, it's, not, uh, it's not glossy and it's not fantastic, but sometimes... Uh, the most um, emotive examples of someone being imprisoned is when they walk into court a free person and then they go out the back door straight to prison. Um, it was slightly lost on this, but again, uh, we, we can't uh, overlook the fact that he was jailed for seven months for what he did to these dogs. Mm.
So was RSPCA South Australia awarded costs to compensate for the expense of caring for Hamilton's dogs for all of those months? <clears throat> Short answer is no, uh, we weren't, because uh, uh, given that Hamilton was in custody, um, he was uh, unable to earn a living, uh, his liberty had been taken away from him, and uh, he could not um, afford uh, the costs that, that we were seeking. The, the investigation um, of, of the whole matter, uh, together with vet and shelter fees, cost around $35,000. Um, so uh, we were seeking costs uh, from him. Uh, I knew deep down that the court was not going to impose costs against him because uh, that they just wouldn't uh, in terms uh, with, with someone who's being imprisoned. Um, I mentioned a while ago that uh, it's the uh, penalty of last resort, so they're not going to impose a, a further monetary penalty on him. Uh, so ultimately. Uh, we had to wear the costs. Mm. Um, it, it's frustrating, but um, the courts just aren't going to penalise someone on top of the ultimate penalty. Mm. So, Christy, do you worry that organised dog fighting is still p taking place in other homes across South Australia? Is it something that RSPCA is actively pursuing? Um, no, I, I don't believe at this point in time it is happening in South Australia. Um, we did investigate uh, another couple of properties in South Australia, um, but um, they didn't lead anywhere. Um, we did, however, uh, there was lots of travel done interstate, so we did find a lot of uh, information which um, we passed on to our RSPCA's interstate, um, and their... Um, are currently a couple of investigations going on, I believe, in WA and Queensland as a result of some of the information that we found through this investigation. Hmm. Damon, would you say that particularly is impressive considering how hard it can be to uncover dog fighting rings? Yeah, it, it is. Detection is the problem uh, because in a traditional sense, uh, these uh, organised fighting rings, are, uh, they involve organised crime. Uh, which happens underground. Uh, it's not reported by day-to-day uh, -day members of the public. The report that we had, uh, as Christy mentioned earlier, came from someone who sounded suspicious themselves. So uh, detection is uh, extremely difficult. Mm. Christy, as the, the lead inspector on all of this, how do you feel about the case overall and the outcome that was achieved? Um, look, it's an extremely sad case um, for obvious reasons um, you know what these dogs went through and other dogs um, it, it's really upsetting um, it's quite shocking as well to think that this was happening in suburban Adelaide um, or that there was involvement you know in in dog fighting happening um, was quite shocking to us um, but you know, I feel really proud that we were able to put a stop to it um, and we, that we were able to hold someone accountable for their actions successfully in court. So, yeah, I feel really proud of all the work that, that we've done to get that result. Mm. Well, thank you so much, the three of you, for coming along tonight and for your incredible work that you and your teams did on this case. I, I think it really just highlights the, the mammoth amount of teamwork and investigation and animal care that goes into every prosecution case um, RSPCA faces. I mean, this one alone was underway for two full years. It's, it's just incredible. Um, as we mentioned, we do have the table of evidence. Go have a look. It's, uh, it's really interesting to see, you know, what was involved in that case. Um, and of course, uh, Christy, Kim and Damon will be available after we finish up to have a chat to you if there's anything else you'd like to know. So thank you very much.